All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Nicole Porter. I'm a professor of law and the director of the Martin Malin Institute for Law and the Workplace, the, a new-ish director. This is my second year. It's been um, quite a privilege to be directing the Institute for the last couple of years. And one of the highlights of being director is the chance to welcome all of you on behalf of the Malin Institute and Chicago Kent College of Law to the 45th annual Kenneth Piper Memorial Lecture. We should begin, as always, by thanking Virginia Piper for her vision and generosity in endowing this lecture series in memory of her late husband, Kenneth Piper, who was a senior labor relations executive with Motorola and Bosch and Lam. The Piper Lecture remains the crown jewel of the Institute, and it was the first public program established by the law school in the labor and employment field. It's truly the foundation for everything the Institute has become, from our nationally respected JD certificate program, to our well-respected peer-reviewed journal, and to our many, many, many public conferences. Um, speaking of which, you will we have two more events this spring. So first, we are hosting a symposium titled All About Accommodations on Friday, March 22nd. As some of you know, um, one of my areas of expertise is employment discrimination law, so I'm excited to host a truly impressive group of esteemed academics and advocates for this important discussion of the ways in which the law addresses the need for accommodations in the workplace. And then on Thursday, April 25th, Back by popular demand, we are hosting the Hot Topics in Labor Law Conference. We have a great lineup of speakers, including current and past board officials, lawyers from Region 13 of the NLRB here in Chicago, and many experienced attorneys from both the management and labor side of the aisle. So I hope you can join us for one of these events. Okay, so back to the Piper Lecture. So I wanna take a moment to thank so many people who helped to make this event possible. Um, so first, thank you to members of our Piper Advisory Board. And if you're here and just wanna hold up your hand when I say your name, that would be great. Um, so much appreciation to Derek Barella, Robert Block, Amanda Clark, Terry Creamer, Joshua File, Angie Hamada, Wes Kennedy, Jessica Kimbrough, Taylor Muzzy, Abby Rogers, and Anna Wormuth. So thank you all. I want to thank our administrative staff, both CLE and our technical experts who make events like this possible. Thank you to CJ Kovacs, Kelly Change, Latoya Keys, Sue Jaden, Alton Jackson, and David Townsend. Thank you also to our Dean, Anita Krug, whose support has been very important to me and the Institute. Um, in these last couple of years. And of course, everything we do at the Institute is possible because of my predecessor, Professor Emeritus Marty Malin, who is here somewhere. I know I just saw him. Um, so the Institute would not be what it is today without his decades of doing the work that he loves so much. So thank you, Marty. Um, last but certainly not least, I would be lost without Assistant Director of the Institute, Professor Emily Elisa, and Program Associate Tristan Kirvin. This job would be impossible without their wise counsel and hard work. So with my sincere apologies if I've forgotten anyone, let me introduce our Piper lecturer and his topic. So first, the topic. So the title of Professor Hirsch's talk, as you can see it on the screen, Labor Regulation of AI. So when the Piper Advisory Board met, several people expressed a desire to do something um, related to technology and specifically AI, given its prominence in the news and our everyday lives. If memory serves, we actually met before the Hollywood writers and actors strike. So it was kind of fortuitous that our already timely and important event became even more um, timely and important. In any event, once the topic was decided, it was there was really just one obvious choice for the speaker, Professor Jeffrey Hirsch. So not only is Professor Hirsch a national expert in this area, but I also knew that I could count on him to do a great job and actually respond to my many emails. And here's a little secret. I can't say that about all law professors. So I appreciate that about him. Okay, so let me just tell you a little bit more about Professor Hirsch. He is the Geneva, Geneva Yergin Rayan Distinguished Professor of Law at the University of North Carolina School of Law. He served as Associate Dean for way more years than most people are willing to serve in that role, myself included. Um, his teaching and research focuses on labor and employment law issues, and he's authored numerous books, book chapters, articles, and essays on topics, including technology in the workplace, unions, and dismissal law. He's an editor of the Workplace Prof Blog, chair of the prestigious Labor Law Group, research fellow at the NYU Center for Labor and Employment Law, 
former chair of the AALS Labor Relations and Employment Law Section, and former president of the Southeastern Association of Law Schools. Prof Professor Hirsch received University of Tennessee's Faculty Award for Writing Excellence in 2007, Carolina Law's Award for Excellence in Service in 2018, Carolina Law's Award for Excellence, uh, Teaching Excellence in 2019, and in 2021, he received the Paul Stephen Memorial, or yeah, Memorial Miller, I said that wrong, Paul Stephen Miller Award for Outstanding Academic and Public Contributions to the Field of Labor and Employment Law, which is awarded by our peers, other labor and employment academics. He earned his BA from the University of Virginia, master, his Master's of Public Policy from the College of William and Mary, and his JD from NYU School of Law, where he received numerous awards. He then clerked for Judge Mayer on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit and Judge Beezer on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, litigated in the National Labor Relations Board's appellate court branch, and taught for several years at University of Tennessee College of Law um, before moving to University of North Carolina, also visited at Vanderbilt. So with that impressive introduction, and I mean the bio, not the delivery, um, please join me in welcoming Professor Hirsch to the podium. Well, thank you, Nicole, as always. Uh, and this is really is quite the honor. Uh, as many of you know, the Piper Lecture really is the preeminent uh, sort of speaking event for uh, labor academics. I thought it just meant I was getting older, but apparently it's because I can answer emails, um, which will teach me. Uh, but really, it really is a pleasure to be here. And I want to echo the thanks uh, that Nicole gave uh, to the staff here at Chicago Kent, uh, who have been fantastic. Uh, to Nicole and, of course, Marty himself, uh, whose leadership has made uh, the center here uh, so well known and, and such an excellent place to discuss labor and employment issues. I wanted to thank uh, commentators, Danielle uh, and Brad, even over dinner last night. Uh, they were, you know, telling me where I went awry. Uh, and then, of course, to thank all of you for being here. Um, and hopefully we'll uh, have a good Q&A session afterwards. Um, because uh, you know, even the draft that you all saw really is just a draft. This is an issue that, frankly, even if it were, was done, uh, is constantly changing. Um, and so uh, being able to talk amongst ourselves about a lot of these issues, I think, are quite important. Um, and I should just note as well, right, as, as Nicole alluded to, uh, you know, oftentimes we don't think of labor, at least other people don't think of labor law as being that much of a hot topic. Of course, over the last few years, it's been a, a sort of a little bit of a re renaissance for us labor folks, uh, where we've seen a lot of companies and labor issues in the news. Even in my decidedly non-union state of North Carolina, uh, I can't tell you the number of sort of media calls I've gotten over the past year for a variety of issues uh, related to labor, unions, things like that. And then, of course, again, also as Nicole noted, right, AI is, is even writ large one of the bigger issues that we as a society are seeing, and particularly in the legal field, right, because of the, the widespread changes uh, that AI is producing in a variety of spheres uh, in our public life, right, the law is obviously quite important. And just because that's not enough, we, of course, will throw in Hollywood just to take the level of interest up a little bit higher. Uh, it's rare I can maybe hit so many different popular points in, in one particular talk, but, but here we'll go. Um, so just as a sort of an initial comment, uh, obviously I'm talking about today uh, the regulation of AI, and in particular, right, we're currently in a, a time period where the amount of government regulation uh, really is very, very small. Uh, and even where it exists, it doesn't do very much. Right Into the void uh, has been, or at least is beginning, uh, we're beginning to see, is regulation occurring with labor, right? You've got employees, unions, or quasi-unions, and management, right, working their way through issues, trying to regulate in ways that we're not seeing government regulate, right? This is a good thing in, in my view, right? This is something, frankly, even if there were, or even when there is government regulations, I think there still is an important role for labor uh, regulation of the various issues that AI presents. And what I'm gonna do is talk about first a little bit what AI is, talk about some of the issues it's presenting in the workplace. We'll talk about the Hollywood strike and some other things. 
and then we'll open it up to, to some comments. So first stop, of course, always a tech problem. Uh huh. Let's see here. Sorry. <laughs> I do this without, but I actually have videos for this one. Do you see? That's not working. No. That's Sometimes working you gotta click in here if they. This is classic, by the way, right? That you're gonna. Which what did you hit? Or... Um. Okay, you got it. All right. Yep. Thank you, Nicole. As usual, Nicole is like the ultimate fixer in everything I do with her. She's the one that's gonna fix it. Uh, so what is AI? And I'm just. This is gonna be grossly brief. But, you know, in spite of what perhaps uh, most people think of, or at least used to think of AI, um, or, uh, you know, certainly the origins of AI, right, is not an attempt to sort of mimic human thinking, right? That, that at least initially was sort of the goal, but for the most part, that's not what's going on. What AI really uh, encompasses, and it's probably better to think of it as a much broader term, are various types of sort of advanced computing, right? machine learning, uh, data analytics, uh, computer generation, right? These are ways in which uh, computers are basically using a vast amounts of data uh, to uh, basically accomplish some sort of goal that it's been given. And one of the defining characteristics typically of AI is it's able to learn, it's able to get better. Right, it's sort of gets various corrective prompts uh, from usually from humans, although not always, uh, and it gets better at whatever its goal is. Right, and it's particularly good at certain things. So, for instance, some of the early uses or widespread uses of AI are identifying objects. So, for, for instance, in the earlier work, I talked to a bunch of AI scientists, and right, they always would go to immediately to the use in medical scans. Right. When it works properly, AI is much, much, much better than humans at evaluating medical scans, finding cancers, things like that. Um, and so that's one of the, the main uses. Analyzing data is another big one. Right. You've got vast quantities of data that uh, pre prior computing and certainly humans simply aren't able to handle. Uh, but AI can do uh, find analyses, connections, uh, make various predictions that that we haven't seen uh, until recent memory. And then, of course, what we're starting to see more of now, and we'll talk about more shortly, uh, is the use of AI to generate things, text, uh, images, audio, audio is being a little slower, but still coming up, things like that. Now, AI does have limits, uh, right? It's not good at these so-called soft skills, right? Those of you who take your role as counselors seriously, you're safe for at least a little while. This is not something the ethics, uh, moral morality, not something that AI is particularly good at dealing with. Uh, there's some other limitations on AI. It's extremely data intensive, right? And certainly particularly, you know, it's hard to believe that we're still in the early stages, but we are, right? There's the ability to organize and provide data for AI systems uh, oftentimes is a hurdle, uh, although that's getting better uh, as, as sort of things developed over the years. And then the other important thing I want to mention about AI is, uh, although sometimes it can be sort of a standalone uh, product, if you will, it's also used frequently along with other technologies, right? Robotics, monitoring, things like that. AI is sort of an enhancer. Uh, of a variety of other technologies. And so, so we're, being, we're seeing it, and you may not even know it's there oftentimes, really in a, an increasing uh, a span of different things uh, that, that humans bump up against. Um, now, of course, uh, unsurprisingly, a new technology oftentimes incorporated in the workplace. Many of you know all of this, so I'm gonna, I'll go quickly through this one. I mean, the biggest one, of course, is AI as uh, being used to perform uh, various work that humans perform, or at least change the way in which humans perform work. Uh, people analytics is a big one. This is the analytical ability of AI, looking at data based on workers, uh, figuring out ways to make them work better, um, things like that. Monitoring is a huge one. Obviously, this is an old thing, right? Uh, employers have always wanted to monitor what employees are doing. AI makes it much, much easier to do and then analyze what is uh, going on uh, or what is being recorded by that monitoring. Right? AI can 
also increase productivity, not just of individual workers, but of the company as a whole, uh, and oftentimes being used for that. And then we see AI increasingly used in various sort of managerial aspects. So you've got hiring, scheduling, communicating, right? You see particularly gig companies oftentimes uh, when an employee or a worker uh, is communicating with the company, it's frequently just with an AI, it's not with a human at all, right? And so this is just, just a few of the examples that we're starting to see at the workplace. Now, there are of course advantages and disadvantages of AI. And, and I will just say as a prelude, I'll probably focus more on the disadvantages because of course that's setting up the desire or need for more regulation, but it's important to note that there are significant advantages that AI presents. Uh, and I think probably the biggest one, at least to my mind, is health and safety, right? The, the sort of uh, improvements and efficiencies of AI uh, are already starting to show ways in which uh, workplace hazards, uh, you know, chemicals, things like that, are being identified in a much uh, faster and more efficient and more accurate way, right, which can improve worker safety. Uh, it can also help improve the safety of other tech. So uh, we started to see AI, for instance, with the robotics, right? When, when human workers are working alongside automation, that can sometimes present dangers, uh, and AI can really help to mitigate that. Right? There's a variety of other um, sort of related issues, dis disabled workers as well, you might put under this category. I will just so note, right, there is some concern on the other end, particularly, you know, AI used as monitoring or, or really uh, when it tries to heighten productivity, that could create stresses on employees, right, to the extent that they're being uh, required to work faster, harder in certain ways that the AI uh, algorithm thinks it should, should happen. Humans, of course, are not machines, and so that can produce uh, stresses uh, on them. Uh, another issue, which is maybe a little less direct, um, is that I think AI can uh, increase the potential for uh, worker classification issues, right? Something that, of course, uh, we all know about, and I won't go into in any meaningful way, at least uh, unless there's any questions later. But I think particularly the gig companies are a good example, where the AI, Uber being a prime example, right, have allowed uh, the work being done uh, to be done in such a way that it really puts workers in that kind of gray area between employee and independent contractor that's already difficult to begin with, uh, and that can produce costs as well, right? That particularly, there's a lot of evidence that workers who are treated as independent contractors then have lower pay, uh, higher personal social costs. There's tax consequences, of course, as well. Uh, so this is another area where I think AI is pr uh, pushing some potential stresses on the workplace. Uh, another issue that, again, probably many of you are familiar with is bias, right? And this is another one where AI, I think, both has potential and risks, right? And, and for sure, right, the potential of AI to reduce bias, and hiring is the most common uh, example to think of, really is there. And in fact, there's a bunch of AI companies that their entire selling point is to, in fact, reduce bias, increase the diversity of workplaces, right? remove the troublesome aspect of human decision-making uh, that does produce unwanted bias at times. Um, and there really is a potential for that. However, right, it is not automatic. And as we've already seen, there are potential problems where not only will AI decision-making not reduce bias, but it itself can actually produce bias, right? A lot of that has to do with problems with data, whereas as I mentioned before, AI is only as good as the data it's used. And to the extent that, you know, the sort of garbage in, garbage out problem exists, right, this can create a problem uh, with AI being used for hiring, things like that. There's also issues of sort of what AI is being told to do, right? To the extent that uh, it's, it's the algorithm's goal is to hire a, quote, better worker. Well, what does that mean, right? That's dependent on the humans to tell it initially what that means. Uh, and so that can be problematic. AI, of course, also typically looks at uh, correlations, which aren't necessarily causation. Uh, and I'll give an example of that in just a moment. And then, of course, to the extent that uh, we can regulate under our current laws, and, and I know Brad had a lot to do with this when he was at the EOC, uh, right? Those laws aren't necessarily uh, tailored in a way that, that easily captures the problem going on. And this black box problem is one of those where 
either a third party vendor is producing the algorithm and so the employer doesn't really know what's going on or frankly sometimes uh even the developer doesn't right because part of the uh entire uh the way the ai works is that it's sort of developing its own filtration system as it goes along and it can be difficult to know what it's doing the example that probably many of you have heard about that really encapsulates a lot of this problem is amazon's experience uh, with AI, right? Amazon has always been uh, sort of at the forefront on using technology, particularly for uh, within its workplace. Uh, and it for many years tried to develop an AI program to uh, uh, assist it in hiring various types of jobs. Uh, to its credit, it never actually implemented it because it discovered that its system uh, was weeding out any applicant it determined was female. Right. Anything in its right that it could like, oh, that applicant's uh, female. No. Right. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the reason wasn't because of any intent, at least we, I, I think we think we can assume so. Right. It's because of how the AI program was learning. Amazon, unsurprisingly, gave it its own data, right, based on its own applicant pool and its own workplace which were dominated by men at the time. So essentially, the AI uh, algorithm learned that being male was associated with being a good employee. The converse of that is not being male isn't, right? And the result was discrimination, right? Certainly not intentional, but this is just an example that, that you have to be careful uh, with the use of AI or it can produce results that uh, is the exact opposite of what the goal is. Uh, privacy and monitoring is another big one, of course, right? And, and again, this is an old issue, right? Ever since there's been employees and employers, there's been monitoring, uh, and that will never end. But AI has basically supercharged uh, much of the monitoring that we've already seen, everything from geo-tracking, uh, activities at the workplace, whether it's computer use, actually physical activities, movements, um, off-duty uh, conduct at times. What AI, I think, really does, though, as far as an additional concern, is its ability to analyze the data that the modern systems are picking up, right? And we saw more Amazon, uh, particularly with Whole Foods. Some of you may know that Amazon had a system where it was using sort of AI, similar type technology, uh, to make predictions about certain stores and employees, including the propensity to engage in union activity. Uh, other things uh, AI can do is even just using simple visual, uh, like a recording of, of a video of a person, it can diagnose certain medical conditions. An older example, even it's probably about five or six years old now I think of that, not in workplace related, uh, but Target, uh, had actually had a system based on shoppers' buyers habit, buying habits, uh, and it was sending certain customers pregnancy or child-related uh, like offers before they themselves knew they were pregnant, right? And this is just uh, you know some some small examples of what AI can do. Um, now again, pros and cons, right? There's a lot of benefits to AI with monitoring again safety. Uh, reducing injuries by improving the way that workers uh, move around, uh, productivity, compliance with other laws. I think this is one that oftentimes gets overlooked, right? Using AI to you know, filter communications to avoid harassment, uh, wage and hour violations, which of course uh, are easy to, to, to violate at times, uh, can be important advantages, but there are obviously costs as well. The privacy intrusions in particular are a real concern. And again, this sort of stress and burnout that I mentioned before. Uh, and then finally, uh, job displacement, right? Changing the way in which we work, right? The sort of uh, extreme version is actually replacing workers uh, with AI or AI-assisted technology. That is certainly happening. I don't think too widespread at the moment, but it's, it's only growing. Uh, and I, then I think uh, sort of the bigger impact, at least as far as number of workers, is changing the way that workers work. Right, similar, if not more so than computers several decades ago. Uh, and a lot of this are price pushing stresses on um, workers and leading to demands for, for regulation. So I'm gonna go through this one fairly quickly. There have been various, uh, we've seen various attempts to regulate. There's been some state action, uh, including some bills in California recently that, that are tied to the workplace. Um, 
on the federal level, I think I mentioned the EOC has been looking into things, although that's not uh, any changes in law. It's more of uh, interpreting current law to provide guidance. Uh, we've got, you know, on the Senate side, the Senate at least has set up a framework for any sort of AI-related bills, although I've yet to see too many that have uh, really directed at the workplace, although uh, hopefully they'll be coming at some point. Uh, we also have some executive orders. There were some, a couple of earlier AI-related ones in the Trump administration. Uh, Biden, just a few months ago in October, uh, issued another executive order that actually did have some workplace uh, specific provisions to it, uh, basically trying to get agencies uh, and other aspects of the government to focus on some of the issues that I've been talking about. Uh, there's actually a tracker now uh, out of Stanford that, that's sort of looking at what uh, the government is doing under the executive order, but it's still, again, only a few months old. Uh, so what, if anything, will come out of that? I'm not sure. This is all a long way to say, of saying there's not a lot out there particularly with regard to AI in the workplace. Uh, one of the things I think I will mention though, because this is of course a labor conference, uh, is my favorite topic, which is the fact that you've got an old law that's oftentimes uh, maligned for not having been amended in a significant way for decades, uh, that actually might have some impact on AI, right? Because as we know, the National uh, Labor Relations Act, although far from perfect, has a lot of flexibility built in. Uh, and this is something that Brad's written quite a bit about. Um, currently, there's a proposal by the general counsel uh, to presumptively ban surveillance and other automated technology uh, that might tend to interfere with employee Section 7 rights. Now, there's a lot of questions uh, about exactly how that would uh, work in practice. Um, and, uh, you know, one example was, was restrictions of time that, that might be used for Section 7 activity. There is a rebuttable, rebuttable presumption, of course. Uh, and what I think is interesting is that as part of uh, her proposal, the general counsel noted that even if AI was being uh, allowed to be used, uh, that there had to be a disclosure requirement. Um, and again, one uh, issue, and we'll see this disclosure pop up uh, a little bit later, I think it's quite important. The board obviously hasn't acted on this yet. Even if it does, I don't know exactly what it will do. Uh, but it is important to note that, right, this is an act that might have uh, at least some sort of role uh, in regulating AI, but at this point, it really hasn't. So that moves us to Hollywood, right? And as, as all of you know, uh, although the, certainly the strike uh, involving uh, the Writers Guild and SAG-AFTRA uh, wasn't limited to AI issues, it was a key component, right? Danielle uh, will, I'm sure, help us talk about this some more. Um, and it was, of course, the headline, right? Because uh, both the writers and actors saw these problems. Uh, I'll give you some examples in a moment, uh, and we're extremely concerned about them. And as a result, right, this is this produced, you know, hundred plus day strikes uh, and a and a contract that ultimately, uh, although not of course perfectly, but addressed various AI issues in a way that we really haven't seen up to this point. Um, and so, just by way of example. Right, this is all AI ge generated. I should note, totally free. This took me about 30 seconds, and I have no idea what I'm doing. I am not good at this. I enjoy the technology, I enjoy talking about it, uh, but I am not a computer science person. Uh, I'm not going to say that this is going to earn an Oscar anytime soon, but it's not bad, right? Uh, and this was, you know, using Chat, BG, chat GPT and uh, ImageFX, which is, is a free. Uh, AI generator from Google. Uh, there's another one. I think I just basically the prompt was, you know, give me a crime thriller summary with, and I couldn't use names. I originally tried to do Taylor Swift and Beyonce, but because the copyright pr trademark protections, they wouldn't let me do it. Uh, but this is essentially uh, what you get out of that. Um, and so uh, what we then saw finally in, the, in this uh, contracts negotiated. Uh, first were the writers, right? And of course, each the writers and actors had different concerns about, about AI. Um, I'm a little bit cut off here with the, with the, the top one uh, basically talks about things that are prohibited under the agreement. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'll note, I, I won't go through all the details just because of time, but I think one of the important features uh, both with the writers and the actors agreements is they're not trying to ban or stop AI entirely. 
right? They are working with the studios to try to regulate the use of AI in order to protect, right, the writers or the actors' concerns. In fact, there was a good quote from, or a good comment from one of the um, writers, uh, sort of negotiating members saying, you know, essentially, the, you know, the, the summation was, this is an old story, uh, it's just a new technology, right? We're not fighting AI, we're fighting the studios. Uh, you know, we're ensuring that they're not using yet another tool to sort of uh, uh, take away uh, our compensation. He said it in a much more colorful way that I won't repeat because I'm being live streamed. But, uh, you know, and so essentially the agreement, right, tries to prevent uh, AI being forced on writers and most importantly, uh, uh, in a way that would reduce the amount of credit and compensation that writers would normally receive, uh, though it expressly provides that writers can use AI with studio permission uh, and involves uh, certain types of notice requirements if uh, writers are given scripts that were uh, written in part by AI. Now, there are various uh, open questions, as is always the case. Uh, the enforcement measures were a little unclear. I think in some people's mind, uh, and of course, there's always uh, it can be difficult to know if AI was involved early in the process, right? So, for instance, one writer might have used AI, studio might not be aware of it, then gets passed off to another writer. What do you do about that? So, so some various uh, issues there, but again, not uncommon. Uh, the actors agreement, right? Obviously, some different, albeit related concerns. Uh, one of the things I think is interesting in the actors agreement is it defines various types of uh, AI usage. This is something uh, with regulation you need to watch out for. Uh, we've already seen some bills in various states that sort of talk about AI, but don't bother to define what it means in a specific context, which is not particularly helpful. Um, but basically, right, uh, they're sort of defining three different buckets. One is where you have a human actor who's participating with the studio in using AI based on uh, either the, their image or their actual acting performance. Uh, there's just a pure independent related AI. Right, it's they may have an AI algorithm may have scraped a lot of uh, data, which is a concern as well, uh, and come up with its own sort of independent uh, replica, not based on any human actor. And then there's this di digital alteration, which I'll show you an example of in a moment, where you have a, a human and they're being altered in some way. Right, their their performance is basically the same, but they're being tweaked in some way. Right. The agreement has a variety of uh, measures, which, which we don't have time to get into all the details, uh, but it imposes a consent requirement um, before any sort of digital replicas. There are exceptions to that uh, for various sort of uh, First Amendment and fair use. Uh, it ensures payment, uh, which of course is always a, a top concern based on employment related replicas. Um, there are were various concerns, although my understanding uh, is that it was uh, adopted by membership at a pretty typical vote. Um, and I don't mean to uh, suggest that somehow the deal was bad, but I'm bringing up these criticisms or concerns because uh, it's an example of uh, right open questions, right? And so uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, compensation for these sequels, what type of consent requirement uh, existed. Uh, this is an example of the uh, tweaking the digital replicas, right? So on the right is a, a up and coming uh, fashion model participated in a show. She saw a couple of days later the designers uh, social media, one of her social media pages had the show and with her face being uh, completely changed. She wasn't informed. She wasn't given consent. Uh, notice it was changed. The race was changed, right? This is a part of the concern uh, that some of the actors have with AI. Um, the other concern, of course, is your classic one of job replacement, right? That you actually have a synthetic a performer taking over the actor's work. Uh, some of you may have seen that recently, it was like a week or two ago, uh, OpenAI released uh, some examples of this so-called Sora. There's about a 15 minute video that you can look online. And some of the, the videos are amazing. I'm actually gonna do maybe the show two of the most boring clips. Uh, because it shows some of the uh, how realistic this is starting uh, to become. Well, it was realistic. There we go. Uh, and this is actually, this one I know is based on a human actor. This is another one. Um, I'm not sure what it was based on, but it's really getting quite realistic, right? The audio is not there yet. 
Um, and when you start getting to more movements, it gets a, you can start to pick out that it's not quite natural, right? But this is just the beginning, right? And this is the concern that actors and other workers have. Um, and, and what basically the uh, uh, agreement was attempting to do. Uh, one other thing I'll mention, uh, another way in which we're seeing labor regulation, uh, as many of you are aware that there's been a partnership between the FL-CIO and Microsoft. Microsoft also, uh, right, keeping with its neutrality stance. Uh, basically, there's sort of a three-pronged uh, goals with this partnership. One is educational, right, which you see here. Uh, another one is trying to ensure that workers basically have a seat at the table, not only at various uh, sort of setting up workplace practices, but also the technology itself. This obviously is useful for a tech company like Microsoft. And then finally, one thing I haven't mentioned yet, but I think is important is public policy, right? Actually advocating, lobbying, you know, I know Danielle has been involved in some of this work at the federal level. Uh, right, having unions and other employee-oriented organizations actually focusing and helping to shape public policy can quite be quite important. And some of the things we're seeing in the in even the collective bargaining agreements for Hollywood. I've got this other example of Zenimax, which is a, a, a video game developer under Microsoft. Uh, that some of these can be actual templates for future regulation. Um, and so uh, it's not just uh, simply uh, private ordering, it can actually be something that helps uh, more regulation as a whole. And then finally, right, this of course in a lot of ways uh, is our typical advantages, although not always perfect, with collective bargaining, right? And so uh, whether it's a formal union or a more quasi-union, like for instance, we saw with the U Uber Guild in New York, um, which, right, obviously, basically sort of put to the side the classification issue, but managed to uh, negotiate various terms to act as a gap filler, right? Because you had drivers who weren't being covered by uh, the various labor and employment laws. Uh, and so you had uh, basically a labor regulatory system uh, that was imposed through collective bargaining, uh, even if it maybe wasn't formally called collective bargaining, right? Unions have other advantages working, of course, with employers, right? They have oftentimes, uh, if they're in place, they've overcome the classic collective action problem, right? They will have usually relationships both with the employees and the employers. So acting as that conduit, a conduit that has the knowledge and experience Right, the AFL-CIO has an entire technology sort of department or, or uh, center that is focused on these and other related issues that you know most employees just simply don't have access to. And of course, right, going back to our labor rights, right, unions do have a right to bargain and obtain information. And much of the problem that we're seeing uh, with AI now, and even some of the earlier attempts to regulate it by government actors, is even just basic things like informing workers that AI is being used in a way that affects their either getting a job or their jobs and conditions. Right? Unions, of course, have a big leg up on that department already. And then, of course, uh, the ability of labor and management right, to work issues through in ways that our uh, particular interests to that specific workplace are important. This is where the Hollywood example, I think, is, is a great example. But there are a lot of very specific issues involved, uh, both at the writers and then to a different degree, the actors, right? And that sort of tailoring can be quite important, but then still serve as a model uh, to other types of workplaces or other types of bills. Uh, that might actually be um, that might actually be helpful. Uh, and again, at the end, I'll just you know finish by saying, right, we will begin to see uh, government regulation. If I had to bet, which is a bad move because I'm usually wrong, uh, it'll probably be something along the, uh, I'm in the privacy realm uh, and and anything having to do with intellectual property. I think that's where you are starting to see more of a bipartisan uh, move to at least do something. Uh, but needless to say, government regulation is not known for one, being quick, or two, necessarily keeping up with technology. Uh, so there will consistently be gaps uh, to fill, and I think labor will continue to play a vital role 
and serve as a good template for, for these measures as they're coming out. So with that, I will wrap things up and uh, turn it over to Brad and then Danielle. Thank you. I think you wanted to close out, so just to close out the screen. Yeah. Let's do that. Stop share. Okay. Do I have to keep this open? Where's, do I need to keep this open for it to see? Or can I shut it? I can shut it? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so um, that was so interesting. I can't wait for to engage more during our Q&A. As many of you know, it's Piper Lecture tradition to provide commentary from both the labor and management communities. So as our first discussant, we are pleased to welcome Bradford Kelly, who is a shareholder in Littler Mendelssohn's Washington, D.C. office and specializes in advising clients about emerging technologies, including artificial intelligence. Before joining Littler, Mr. Kelly was chief counsel to a commissioner at the EOC, where he provided legal and policy advice on the agency's initiative on artificial intelligence and algorithmic fairness. Previously, Mr. Kelly served as a senior official in the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. His work on AI has been published in the Stanford Law and Policy Review, the University of Miami Law Review, the Marquette Law Review, and several other legal journals. Before becoming an attorney, he was a U.S. Army Infantry and Intelligence Officer, and he is a veteran of the Iraq War. So please join me in welcoming Brad Kelly to the podium. No, thank you very much for having me today, and a special thanks to uh, Professor Porter and her team. It's been very enjoyable. Well, uh, as Professor uh, Porter mentioned in my intro, I uh, joined Littler about, uh, we're the world's largest labor and employment firm representing management, but I joined the uh, firm just last July, and I joined from the EOC, where I was highly involved with the EOC's AI initiative, and before that, I was at the U.S. Department of Labor's Wage and Hour Division. And despite my time in government, I regularly say that it made me into a total Ron Swanson, and uh, it, and I feel like as far as looking at how artificial intelligence is used now. My lecture today is going to kind of focus on how we can approach artificial intelligence regulation moving forward. I regularly counsel employers now in private practice on the use of artificial intelligence. So a lot of the points that I'm going to raise are things that we hear about on the field, on the practical level. So I've created a list of 10 points that I feel like should be kind of guiding the way of approaching artificial intelligence. And these 10 points are largely based off of my time in the government at the EOC and the Wage and Hour Division, and including the Army from before that, to, to see how this can affect labor regulation. But I actually initially became interested in artificial intelligence during my time in the Army. Uh, when I was in the Army, it was during the Iraq War period, and I was uh, when we were deployed, it was part of the surge, and we had a lot of tools that became the precursors to artificial intelligence. And I think that's a very, it was provided a lot of insight into how technology can be very beneficial. Now, I, I think one thing that I want to start off with before getting into the 10 points is how to define artificial intelligence. Now, Jeff did a really good job providing a you know basic overview, but I think this is so critical because a lot of times when you hear about labor and employment agencies, they haven't even attempted to define artificial intelligence. So when you hear the term artificial intelligence used, what do you think of? What's the simplest way to define it? I've broken it down for purposes of workplace AI as computers and algorithms used to approximate human level of intelligence in order to streamline operations, improve productivity, and so forth. Now, during the Super Bowl recently, my wife uh, turned to me uh, during one of the advertisements for a new AI tool called Copilot. My wife said, that's how you should explain artificial intelligence is serving as a co-pilot, something that can assist you when you need it. And I thought that was a very interesting way of looking at it. But when you think of the fact that OCCP put out a revised scheduling letter regulating artificial intelligence, they didn't even attempt to define AI. And so I think that when you think of artificial intelligence, it's so important for looking at how you define it, because if you can't define something, how can you regulate it? 
Against that backdrop, I'm going to move into the 10 points. My first point that I want to highlight about AI regulation is that, in my view, the benefits of artificial intelligence outweigh the risk. Now, for in my practice, I focus on the benefits of artificial intelligence for labor and employment purposes, but it goes well beyond labor and employment with the benefits of AI, especially in the area of medicine. So my father's a neurologist, and he's using artificial intelligence to help treat patients who suffer from Alzheimer's and dementia. My brother is a cardiologist, and he's using it to help patients with things such as detecting the presence of a weak heart pump because a weak heart pump could lead to heart failure if it's left untreated. Now, in the military, the military uses AI in a lot of cases to help with decision-making and to support weapon systems and to help ensure that we have a safer national security. A lot of you today here are law students. Artificial intelligence has a lot of promise to help you get your next job or your jobs later down the road. AI has, if it's appropriately designed and applied, it can help people find their most rewarding jobs and match companies with the most valuable and productive employees. Equally important, AI has been shown to advance diversity, inclusion, and accessibility in the workplace. A lot of people will say that AI is an, uh, a superior alternative to this uh, human subjective assessment. So that if, in the event that artificial intelligence is able to remove that human subjectivity, it could lead to greater diversity in hiring. Now, point two is that because of the incredible benefits of artificial intelligence, we need to be highly concerned with stifling innovation. When we look at these benefits and how much has grown out of artificial intelligence, we need to make sure that any regulation does not stifle that innovation moving forward. Now, at my law firm, we have an annual uh, workplace artificial intelligence summit. In this past year at the summit, we were joined by Congressman Glenn Ivey, who's a Democratic congressman from Maryland, who serves on the AI uh, Congressional Bipartisan Caucus. And when I talked to him as part of the interview at the summit, I asked him, what's the greatest regulatory obstacle for looking at AI? Is it the fact that politicians don't understand AI? Is it the fact that technology is improving so rapidly that it's hard to regulate something that's changing so quickly? Or is it the fact that Congress is concerned with stifling innovation? His response as part of this bipartisan congressional caucus was that the greatest concern from Congress is stifling that innovation because they recognize the rewards and the benefits of, our, of artificial intelligence. Another aspect that we need to consider with stifling innovation is we need to be careful about looking at dated examples. Now, Jeff pointed out the example of Amazon, but one thing that he didn't mention is that example is from 2018. That was six years ago. Think about your when you update your smartphone, whenever you get the newest version of the smartphone, how much the battery life has improved or how much the operating system overall has improved since the last version, especially if you haven't updated your phone in the last couple of versions. That's how it is with artificial intelligence that it's increasingly becoming better. And so a lot of the examples that you focus on need to be cognizant of the fact this, um, in this technology is improving in many ways. Point three, there's a lot of common agreement when it comes to artificial intelligence. I thought Jeff did a great job of talking about the different interaction between the unions and companies in these partnerships that have formed. One of the things that I've really enjoyed about my practice in artificial intelligence is the fact that there's so much common ground. And that common ground, I think, will be incredibly important with how to address AI regulations in the future. Now, Jeff focused in his paper on what unions are doing with artificial intelligence, but a lot of private companies are doing the same thing. It's become common practice for many companies to create their own internal best practices, their own internal policies, and form diverse partnerships. A lot of major companies have formed partnerships with different civil rights groups, such as the ACLU, and it provides, I think, that we need to take advantage of that common ground to reduce the risk that Jeff identified in the uh, in his article. Point four, is congressional action the answer here? Now, will Congress do anything? Highly unlikely. Congress can barely keep the lights on, so Congress legislating in this area seems increasingly unlikely. Even Jeff notes in his article that Congress, however, has been unable to move past discussions on AI. Even though I'm opposed to certain legislation, I think there is some useful legislation to consider. 
One example is that any federal approach should seek to eliminate or at least minimize the compliance burden created by a patchwork of state and local regulations. Congress should seriously consider having a national set, uh, standard on artificial intelligence that includes preemption. When you have a lot of major employers who operate in many different jurisdictions across states and localities, it's hard if you don't know the local law that you're complying with. So erasing those burdens with artificial intelligence will be incredibly important moving forward, especially since that's key to ensuring that we're not stifling the innovation. Point five, if Congress isn't the answer, our federal agency is the answer. Like Congress, government agencies have been largely ineffective in my view. The EOC, for example, has only issued a handful of technical assistance documents, and none of those documents have been voted on by the full commission. Now, the EOC consists of five presidentially appointed and Senate confirmed members. And as part of that, you know, there's no reason that you can't have the members vote on certain guidance documents. It gives the documents more legitimacy, but the EOC has not done so. The EOC has also not issued any guidance almost a year on artificial intelligence, even though AI initiative was launched in October of 2021, and a lot's happened since that time. The EOC has also not issued a comprehensive set of best practices. You know, a lot of employers and unions and others are looking to um, agencies to issue more guidance, but if that guidance isn't forthcoming, what are they going to do? There's also been no EOC guidance on generative AI. Now, in the employment context, there's generally two types of artificial intelligence that are used. Predictive AI, which is basically taking large sets of data and making predictions based on that data to basically predict what success will look like. The most common example is a resume sorter, where you have a gold standard candidate, and you take that information and you try to replicate it to identify who the best candidates are moving forward. Now, the NRB, for example, has also not been very effective on artificial intelligence, in my view. I've been very critical of the uh, um, AI memo that was put out from the general counsel at the NRB. Point uh, six, will the answer fall on state and local jurisdictions? A lot of state and local jurisdictions have been looking at a different AI laws to address it in the absence of congressional action, but a lot of this has been ineffective. Just this past week, I was interviewed by Law360 in an article entitled, Everyone Ignores the New York City's Workplace AI Law. The article says the New York City AI law has proved to be a toothless flop and ineffective. A recent Cornell study shows that most employers are simply ignoring the law because it was so poorly crafted. Point seven, it's important for the government to, to operate in an echo chamber. One example of this is the EOC's only conducted one non-technical public hearing, and this failed to include any AI vendors, and these are the ones who are actually involved with creating and developing the artificial intelligence software that employers rely on, but the EOC did not include anybody from that vantage point. Point eight, one of the biggest problems in my mind is the ping-pong effect of government labor and employment regulations. Now, we all know that in recent decades, when different presidential administrations change that there's a huge swing. And in the labor employment context, it will be pro-employer generally for Republican administrations and then swing to the pro-employee slash pro-union side when there's a Democratic administration. But the problem has become that it's hard for employers who are trying to comply with the law to rely on rules that are subject to so many wide swings. And that creates a lot of problems, especially with employers looking for certainty, especially with things like artificial intelligence that are rapidly changing. Point nine, employers want to comply with the law. A great deal of my practice involves creating policies, internal best practices with employers. And most employers, in my experience, aren't looking to discriminate. They want to comply with the law. Point 10, and the final point, we should not and cannot wait for the government to react. I regularly speak at AI conferences, and one of the questions I frequently ask is how many in the audience know if their organization has an AI policy? How many here know if their organization has an AI policy? How many know what it says? Is it a blanket ban? Is it, does it allow some uses of artificial intelligence? It's something to consider. But those who don't have it, you know, 
it, it's an effective way of addressing the different risk of artificial intelligence to say what's happening internally in an organization. So instead of waiting for the government, think of proactive ways such as having a policy and internal best practices. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Brad. All right, finally, we welcome our labor side commentator, Daniel Van Leer, who is Senior Assistant General Counsel for Contracts and Compliance at SAG-AFTRA, where she is responsible for managing SAG-AFTRA's third-party contracts and intellectual property, as well as other efforts aimed at protecting the rights of SAG-AFTRA and its members. She has written several amicus briefs before the U.S. Supreme Court, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the California Supreme Court regarding rights of publicity, copyright, and other issues impacting the entertainment industry. She's an adjunct professor at Southwest Southwestern Law School, where she's taught courses on the entertainment guilds and trademark law, and she previously taught sports law and entertainment law at Western State College of Law. She's a sought-after speaker and has spoken to global audiences on topics such as deep fakes, rights of publicity, copyright, and the entertainment guilds. Ms. Van Leer earned her JD from Washington University School of Law in St. Louis. She has a BA in Japanese Language, Literature, and Cultural Studies from UC Santa Barbara. In 2019, she earned an LLM with Merit in Innovation, Technology, and the Law through University of Edinburgh. Please join me in welcoming Daniel Van Leer to the podium. Thanks, Nicole. And I want to echo the um, the thanks that everybody else gave to the, the school and the staff. Um, and I also have to admit to a little bit of imposter syndrome. Um, since I was invited over our national executive director, Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who um, is has been very uh, vocal on these topics. And, um, you know, I, I always have a little rivalry with Duncan because I like to say I started, um, I'm sorry, I should be talking to the mic, shouldn't I? A few days before him or a few, few months before him at the union. So, um, you know, we had a little back and forth on this one. Um, so it's it's really heartening to me that Chicago Kent Law School is devoting this time to the to the, discussing the implications of AI technology. Um, it's a, it's a really as we've seen a very vital topic, and I'm you know thrilled to see so many people engaged on it at this point in time. Um, something I've been speaking on a lot lately, and it's been obviously a lot of coverage lately. Um, the paper Jeff just presented addressed uh, an. Sorry, I'm having, it's a morning, right? It's, it's, and it's early for LA time. Um, you know, it, it addresses an important topic that's one of my core responsibilities at sag After for the last several years, but never so much as in this last year. Um, you see, we had this little strike that was mentioned and, and it got a little bit of news coverage. Um, and I even see some of our folks are here for, for this um, event. So I, I wanna thank them for coming out. Um, as Jeff noted, AI was one of the central issues in, in our strike, and it wasn't the only one, um, of course, especially for our members, but it definitely was the one that had the most news coverage, I think, other than maybe the streaming residuals got a little bit as well, um, and it definitely had the most creative picket signs. Um, I think there was a whole um, Instagram account devoted to picket signs out there, and uh, it, was, it was fun to see what uh, particularly the writers were coming up with. Um, so before I get into this discussion, I want to disclose some of my own biases on the topic. Um, obviously, the most obvious is that I've worked at SAG-AFTRA for almost 24 years now. I'm going to fall just far of that mark because one thing Nicole didn't mention is that I'm actually outgoing senior AGC and um, Friday is my last day. So I'm spending my last week here with you all. Um, and obviously, I'm here to provide a labor perspective on this. But I'm also a lifelong nerd who loves new technology. Um, going back to the Atari 2600, I've been playing games. So um, I've used ChatGPT a bit to help me through writer's block. And maybe I'm going to borrow Jeff's results for my um, next screenplay. Um, I am a screenwriter as well. <laughs> um, I've, I used it to help me. I'm doing an MBA right now. I've used ChatGPT to help refresh my recollection on certain theories that I had studied um, as I started working on my capstone. 
Blackstone. Um, and I even used, I, I don't know if you all use Westlaw here, but Practical Law has an AI research tool now, and I even played around with that a bit to write a paper for an ABA conference I'm speaking at next week, um, because part of the topic was a little bit outside of my expertise. Um, I also do photography on the side, <laughs> and um, yeah, busy these days. Um, and I've used uh, Adobe's tools to edit out distractions from my papers. Um, and I also come at this topic with a healthy bit of um, skepticism. I was on a panel last week at Stanford um, Law School about um, non-human creativity versus human creativity. And um, as Jeff said, uh, AI doesn't do well with soft skills. So I kind of think non-human creativity is a bit of an oxymoron right now and that the role of humans it probably, at least in creativity, is not going away in, in the very short term, at least. Um, so I approach this topic generally with a healthy respect for the technology and also for the workers impacted by it. Okay, so now that that's out of the way, <laughs> um, Jeff's paper provided, you know, although as, as you mentioned, I had some notes, um, as we say in the industry, um, the paper provided an excellent overview of the role unions can play in addressing new technologies, um, particularly when the government is slow to act and, you know, regardless on which side of the aisle you fall on, and as uh, Brad mentioned, the government is slow to act on just about anything these days. And, you know, when it comes to AI, I'm hoping maybe the Swifties will get some action action moving, um, you know, after what happened a few weeks ago, um, but that's a topic for next week's conference. <laughs> um, so let me provide some additional context drawing from my experience working on AI and those issues at sag after over the last um, probably 13 years or so. Um, you know, the uniqueness of the entertainment industry and the issues our members face I mean my perspective is going to be a little bit different than a traditional labor perspective. Um, but I do um, want to touch on some of these issues, and, and there's some important points that Jeff made that I don't want to gloss over. Um, the first of these is the use of AI in worker tracking and monitoring, um, or as I like to call it, Big Brother. Um, it, part of my responsibilities at sag after have included privacy, so I follow that topic with a bit of interest. Um, and outside of entertainment, that's one of the more troubling areas for me. Um, and it, you know, frankly, it should trouble everybody um, because it, for, for many reasons, but particularly it becomes a gendered issue. Um, about six or seven years ago, I was on a panel about wearable technology in employer wellness programs. You know, you get a discount on your health care if you wear a Fitbit. Um, even back then, and it may have even been longer than that, um, these devices were able to analyze user data which was often being sold to advertisers. Um, and the things that that were that this data could figure out were kind of troubling. Like there were reports of women being served ads for related to pregnancy and babies before they even knew they were pregnant. Um, and that's because of data that was being captured by their wearables. So, you know, these kind of things are uh, can be a little concerning, especially, um, with today's computing power and analytical technology, you know, how far are we from employers making discriminatory, from an employer's AI and making discriminatory recommendations regarding employees um, due to lost pr productivity due to pregnancy before the employer even knows they're pregnant? Um, and does the employer really need to know that they're pregnant at that point in time? And of course, there's the bias issues, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit later. Um, there also are also privacy issues around protected activity. Activity is protected under the NLRA, right? So um, that is another concern, I think, for the labor movement. But one of the first things that really jumped out to me as I was reading the, the paper was the premise that unions are uniquely situated to uh, fill in this regulatory gap. And Jeff noted, and I'm going to quote from the draft, um, that unions have the formal represent representative status, experience, incentive, and knowledge to advocate on behalf of workers in a manner that also seeks to preserve company success. And it was that last part that really stood out to me, that to preserve company success. And I really think that gets lost in a lot of labor management discussions, um, especially when they get a little bit acrimonious. Um, and that's sometimes on both sides of the negotiating table. But it's so critical to acknowledge that because unions have an incentive to ensure the health, longevity, and success of the companies that, that employ their members. 
Um, of course, if your only measure of success is on the balance sheet or in the dividends being paid to institutional investors, I can see why that might seem shocking. But there was a time um, when even management agreed on the importance of a unionized workforce and the employer protections that it came with it. Granted, I was in elementary school around that time, and maybe in middle school when one of SAG AFTRA's or SAG's former presidents became president and accelerated that. Um, but the fact is, unions and their members have an incentive to ensure their companies um, succeed. And I'll let you learn a little secret for the management side, folks. Most unions generally recognize that, um, even if their public rhetoric dis differs. Um, and our negotiators really did uh, this year. Um, when it came to AI in particular, we recognize that the rapidly developing nature of this new technology and the pr pressures our employers were feeling from the technology companies, some of whom we were also negotiating with at the time, um, we knew we needed to work with the employers to ensure their continued success and the success of the industry while also protecting our members. So we took a very pragmatic approach, and if you've read about the strike, it's been lauded by expert commentators who see it as setting a path forward. You know, as Jeff mentioned, there's one of our expert commentators, right? Um, setting a path forward, not just for other uh, unions, but more generally as regulators and others grapple with this area. So I wanna clear one thing up. Jeff mentioned this as well. And this is something our national executive director, Duncan Crabtree Ireland, who I mentioned, has reiterated many times. We never sought to ban the use of AI in our industry. There were plenty of picket signs saying that, and there were members on the picket lines, including some of our strike captains who may have been saying that, um, and who may have given that impression. But we recognize from the onset that no union has ever stopped the emergence of a new technology, even one that has the potential to displace workers. So we went into this with a pragmatic mindset that focused on putting in place guardrails that would protect our members while also allowing the employers to compete in this new paradigm. And I'll continue to say this every time I have a soapbox to stand on. I'm exceptionally proud of the work our negotiating committee and staff did on this topic. It was um, and just, it, it was amazing. Is it perfect? No, of course not. I will never say it was perfect. Um, but what collective bargaining agreement, heck, what negotiated contract is ever going to be perfect for either side? I, you know, I think that's one thing that I like being a transactional side attorney for the most part is that, you know, both people, both sides walk away a little bit unhappy, but and that means you made a good deal. Um, but this deal made a clear that raised the groundwork and created a really good framework to move forward as this technology develops. And we've already started building on it in other collective bargaining negotiations and in agreement and negotiations with some of the tech companies that are creating this stuff. Um, what's interesting is, um, is that we were more or less, um, oh, sorry, and, you know, I just also wanted to acknowledge again that I was just a small cog in this. Um, I was the contract attorney in a room full of like labor, true labor attorneys um, uh, and actors who had personal stake in it and really, you know, skilled professional staff. I just want to acknowledge it. And as I said, a couple of them are here today. Um, one of our members, our board members is here today. So um, I, you know, it was a true team effort. Um, we were more or less, uh, um, Oh, got a hurry. <laughs> we were more or less starting from zero on this, um, you know, and it's important to understand in this kind of context, you know, there were constraints on us, you know, two, the directors had gone first, the writers, and then us. So we had some kind of language that the studios just weren't going to move off of, including uh, on the definition of, of generative artificial intelligence, which um, as Brad mentioned, it's really important to have clear definitions. Um, so that uh, this all actually dovetails into some of what Jeff wrote about job displacement. One thing I'm really proud of is how we address that in these agreements and the impact of technology. Um, again, rather than brand, brand, next, banning AI, we took an approach to ensure that our members are compensated at roughly the same rate as if they performed the work. We are putting a lot of faith in the employers to reasonably estimate this, but we have a lot of confidence that we can enforce this language in, in an appropriate way. 
We included language relating to what we called independently created digital replicas, which are ones an actor might own and license out to a studio. And we don't ensure, and the language we negotiated doesn't set minimum rates, but it ensures contributions to the pension and health plans for the performers. And we even added protections for um, our deceased performers, whether they die in the midst of production or um, if somebody wants to use somebody who died years ago. Even our language about synthetic performers or what we call synthetic folks, which are the whole AI generated ones like Jeff showed, um, there's language relating to that um, and ongoing uh, discussions for the next few years. Um, of course, there is a potential impact on other unions and some have expressed concern about this impact on other industry workers, such as those doing visual effects and creature animations. Um, ultimately, though, our job is to represent our members, and we laid, I think, a good foundation for the, these other unions to build upon. And there's a big negotiation, two big negotiations coming up this summer, so we may be in for another hot later summer. Um, touching on bias, I, I'm not going to go into the Amazon uh, topic because Jeff talked about it pretty well, but that was another uh, issue that we covered in our agreement um, to ensure that we're having ongoing discussions with the other, with the employers. And I'll note that one issue with, uh, in the generative AI context is, it, again, gendered and racial issues. So if you feed in a prompt asking for a picture of a lawyer, it's probably going to give you something that looks a lot like my co-speakers here. Um, there's also the lacks of transparency, um, you know, using this technology without insight into the data program and programming to analyze, hire, track, maintain, manage, retain, or do anything else with employees, you start getting into the minority report world. Um, and that's another area where unions can play a role. Uh, Jeff mentioned the power of unions on the public policy level and some of the work I've done, uh, both legislatively and the amicus, uh, our amicus programs, um, unions can help bring the voice of workers they represent to the halls of government and the courts. Um, when I worked in Capitol Hill, you know, you may see these mass email or mail campaigns back then. Um, they don't have quite the effect people think they do. Really, it shows, it shows that people are interested in a topic, but really, like it or not, direct lobbying is the strongest role. And that's a role unions can play on behalf of their workers. Um, just for, for instance, we have written and advocated for laws around rights of publicity and deep fakes. We got the law changed in New York, including a postmortem right of publicity. And we got laws uh, that at least provide a, sec uh, a civil remedy for non-consensual sexual deep fakes in New York and California. Um, one of our key lobbying efforts is for a federal law to protect voice and likeness from exploitation under using artificial intelligence, helping to fill a gap that our collective bargaining agreements can't. And those are the No Fakes Act and No AI Frauds bills in the Senate and House, respectively, uh, that will provide important protections. Um, there are also the critical pieces of legislation, as is the Preventing Deep Fakes of Intimate Images Act, which we also worked on in our championing that deals with the non-consensual uh, sexual uh, uh, deep fakes. I'm going to uh, skip ahead with one more um, comment that Jeff, um, to touch on that Jeff, Jeff noted that AI in, introduced issues not contemplated by unions just a decade ago. And that's one, that's one of my very few criticisms because I think it oversimplifies things. Well, we hadn't necessarily contemplated this use for AI. The issues it brought about, at least in our industry, were not new. Um, it's a new technology doing many of the same old things as prior technologies, just more efficiently and in many cases more effectively. For these reasons, um, SAG after staff and now members have been, been attending CES, formerly the Consumer Electronics Show, um, for years to understand the impact of technology in our industry. Together with the AFL-CIO, we host a Labor Innovation and Technology Summit co uh, that coincides with CES. 
and it has grown over the last several years from just a two day, uh, from just a select group of invitees who come to a dinner and get a, a, sh a floor show floor tour. Try saying that five times fast. Um, to a full conference, it was a two day conference this last year with panels and discussions on labor and technology. Um, and in our case, we've been addressing the impact of technology that can change performance for decades. Going on, you know, I think back to the 1999. Uh, Fred Astaire uh, uh, write a publicity act in California when his performance, it wasn't using AI, but he a clip of his performance was altered to show him dancing with a vacuum in an advertisement. Um, same issue, different technology. Um, and, you know, the, a lot of these issues are going to continue impacting our members for years ahead. Um, and, you know, even AI itself, we've been having these discussions since at least 2019. So for us, at least, this wasn't a new issue, just another technology that could do it faster, cheaper, and better. And as you saw last year, we rose to the moment, I think, and I'm really proud of that. So thank you all. Um, thank you, all, Nicole and the law school for the opportunity to comment on this insightful paper. And um, I look forward to our discussion. All right, thank you all. So we have some time for questions. We have microphones. Emily, will you turn that one on? I turned this one on. And will you three make sure yours are flipped on? So if you have a question, if you can come down to one of the microphones, because we are, you know, recording everything so that it can your question can be heard. If not, I'll start. So this is a question for Jeff based on things I heard from both Brad and Danielle. So you know, Danielle was talking about some state specific laws um, and then Brad raised this sort of big problem with having state specific laws for, you know, national employers. How do they handle that? And, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot in the labor and employment world that the state legislatures are where things are happening a lot more than, the, than um, the Fed. So where do you see how this is going to, you know, where is our best place for regulation or, or where might we anticipate it happening? Um, in a more significant way. I think Nicole's setting me up here. This is the, like the one one of the controversial things I've written about in the past that I'm probably un, unusual for academics that I've uh, written a lot about. The fact that, at least to my mind, it makes more sense in a general view to uh, regulate the workplace more at a federal level, just because of some of the issues that you all mentioned. Although, right, the counter to that is particularly uh, a time periods of time where we're not seeing much in the federal government, um, that we are seeing stuff in the state, and I don't deny that. So to the extent you're talking about predictive, yeah, it's the states, right? <laughs> Certain states, right? California, New York, um, you know, some localities even, I think, you know, just from an empirical standpoint, that's where you're going to start to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it'll lead up to the federal government, but we shall see. All right. You want to go ahead? Hi. Um, I've been lucky enough here as a professor to have the past five years to work with students on AI and learning issues and be part of an international collaboration on it. And um, we've updated since the bad Amazon example and found that things are just as bad now and that we may never get to a, a non-discriminatory AI in hiring because it differs so much from the medical models two of you have talked about. You know, when I um, do medically AI, medical AI to see if this indicates a tumor or not, um, I use tens of thousands of samples and I can look at false positives and false negatives. Well, think about the hiring thing. We can't do, you know, false positives, false negatives. We don't know how it would have been if a woman was hired as opposed to a man. And many of the current things being sold and used by 90% of Fortune 500 companies um, actually are, um, say, um, are, are tested on the top 30 employees in a company. Well, that's not tens of thousands of samples. And so we look at you know, the 30 employees, most of them in companies are not, um, are not male, are, are male. So you're not gonna, it's gonna knock out you know, women's resumes, same thing with one-way video interviews and same thing with the trend toward using video games to hire. Um, so in the international group I'm working with of computers and scientists and, and uh, lawyers, 
the computer scientists and engineers say something like they do in Hollywood. We'll fix it in post. <laughs> you know, if it if it doesn't hire enough men, we're just going to tell them to hire the top 10 women that it had originally knocked out. Well, that's not going to work in the United States because we've had cases, I think it was the New Haven firefighters, where, you know, once you um, you can't dip in to the other gender or the other race. And so I think of what LinkedIn is doing currently, they found that men are more likely to apply for jobs they don't have the qualifications for. So if it says you need a, B a PhD, men with BAs will apply. And so what LinkedIn has done is to say, okay, we'll also look at women with BAs who didn't apply. And so uh, I think, particularly with the trend of the affirmative action and so forth, that fixing it in post, which is what you know, AI companies offer as a way to not discriminate because they haven't done the long-term big studies is not to work here. I, I actually have a, a anecdote on that, um, that last comment about men applying for jobs, you know, when they have, I forget what the percentage is, but women will only apply if they meet like 100% or really close to it. Um, I had a friend reach out to me about a really cool job um, about a year, less, probably less than a year ago now. And there was one thing on this list of categories that um, it, I didn't have. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I fit this, what they're really looking for. And I made it, you know, I had the call and I was like one of the leading candidates as it turned out. And I, I you know, I know it's kind of diverging off of the AI topic, but to especially to the female law students in this room or the uh, female presenting law students, don't be afraid to apply. Um, you know, I could have lost out on what was an amazing opportunity and just knowing who I was passed over for was such an ego boost given the, the, the stature, you know, of this person. So don't, don't be afraid to apply. But I think, you know, to the point of AI, um, using AI, I mean, I think we can't ignore the human component. And, you know, you may want to use some AI to, you know, uh, speed up the hiring process or the screening process or deciding on promotions. But there has to be a human element because otherwise, you know, all, all these things that that we talked about. I think one of the things with the Amazon example, I saw a panel at, I, I skipped this over, but I went to a panel that was one of the first experiences I had with AI and ethics. Um, and it was a bunch of female presenting uh, people uh, speaking, uh, uh, HR and, and AI people talking about a ethics of AI. Sorry, my brain is just short-circuiting today. Um, AI and ethics in the hiring process. And they were using the Amazon example. And I think what it was that was causing it to screen out women was that it started to see that high performers had things like varsity baseball or other like very gendered things on their resume. So it started using these gendered, you know, activities as indicators of high performance. And that's one of the big problems with the black box of AI, with feeding in, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And uh, you really, I think these, it, there needs to be a lot more effort put into uh, creating, you know, more neutral AI. And one thing I'll kind of address on that point is that I agree that there are problems, but I do feel like artificial intelligence often is superior to the alternative. You know, human subjectivity, the fact that you can be judged by a machine in a lot of cases, yes, I'll admit you can inherit the bias from a human in that. But in many cases, though, it can at least assist with the process. And, you know, it can anonymize certain information as part of the assessment. So it could take, say, let's say something like names, which are often associated with certain protected groups. It could take that information and lock it out and allow a more objective assessment of the candidate during the process. So I, I do think that there's value in kind of stressing the fact that it is, in my view, superior to the alternative. But I think another point that I kind of piggyback off of Danielle's with the human involvement that, you know, we talk a lot today. I mean, I think the big focus is the government's not doing anything. We are all in agreement with that. 
but as far as what do we do now? How do we ensure that that is, doesn't continue as far as any discriminatory effects and so forth? And I think that even talking about the human involvement, having making sure that you're not setting and forgetting it, it's so critical to have those internal best practices. And I give the unions full credit for they've developed their own best practices, as have most of the companies. And that's something that should be embraced because it's not just about human involvement, but it's also knowing, you know, conducting audits, what's behind the hood. But I think getting back to this point that, you know, a lot of times people talk about the black box of AI and they focus a lot on that. What about the black box of the human mind? You know, I'm a labor and employment lawyer. And whenever there's a case of discrimination, guess how many times I've heard the employer admit, yes, we fired him because of protected class X. It's never happened in my experience. And it's, but I think there's something to be said about the idea that we don't know how to get in the black box of the human mind. And it's something to consider when you hear the black box problems in AI. Uh, briefly on that last point, the idea of bias elimination to someone in the creative field, and full disclosure, I'm with SAG AFTRA, um, would seem to be a one way ticket to a cookie cutter employee for, uh, you know, workforce. That's separate point, but I was really going to ask about, um, several of you have mentioned um, the idea of the patchwork of state laws as being a, a, a negative and needing a federalization of a lot of these regulations. Given the wide disparate nature of industries in, say, New York, California, Illinois, versus uh, I, Alabama, Idaho, Wyoming. I, uh, how how do you get to a point where your which is more important? You know, and, and because they're going to have more business friendly regulations just because of the nature of the beast. Um, other states are going to be much more employee. Uh, um, I'll say friendly for lack of a better term um so sure the federalization is great but how do you make it indifferent to any given administration and still be protective yeah i mean that's a that's a cost potentially to, to any federalization um and maybe it's you know speaking from someone in definitely one of the less employee friendly states the sort of you know the the fear is the the lowest common denominator but yeah that's i mean you know, there are definitely pros and cons to a more decentralized uh, regulatory system, which we have now. Um, and, you know, one of the benefits are there are states like California, there are states like uh, New York, that if you're certainly on the employee side are much, much friendlier. Employers would count this probably as a negative, uh, particularly with compliance cost issues. Um, so, yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I think the um, part of my argument in the past has been sort of as a more general level, um, and frankly, some of it, even though I'm not typically like, the most uh, employer-friendly person on the planet, um, but I think the compliance issues are a major issue, right, that, that having to deal with uh, multiple jurisdictions, uh, you know, you could, you could have a single set of facts that could you know, result in four different uh, statutory claims. You know, some people might be employees for one, but not for the other. It's sort of more looking at that, but right, the, you know, particularly in labor, right, there's been some really interesting stuff at the state, state level and even local level. Um, and I don't, certainly don't discount that. I think some of those things are really interesting. Yeah, I wanna make sure we have, yeah, go ahead, AK. Hey there. Um, I think a couple of you folks had mentioned the idea of partnerships between um, corporations and unions around this issue of AI, which was interesting because I believe, because um, Microsoft was the example here, um, and I assume the majority of the workers at Microsoft are not themselves union. So I was really curious about what those kinds of partnerships or initiatives would look like without having corporations or employers like illegally supporting, assisting, or dominating a union. In a two question. I know. I like I it. Know. <laughs> it a couple of weeks Someone's paying attention. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think go ahead because you were talking about the Microsoft. So. Yeah, no, I mean, and so one of the things, and I was kind of going through fast at that point because of time, 
Um, you're right now, the AFL, Microsoft, that sort of partnership is at a very high level, right? So it's very general. And so you don't have the kind of, um, you know, assistance and support or domination uh, that, that you would be at risk with an 8A2, a company union type issue. Um, although I'll note as an aside, right, I think Microsoft's neutrality stance, you're starting to see more actual utilization. Just one, one small example of that. Um, but yeah, they'll have to be careful about that. Um, now, of course, right, the enforcement and, and remedy for an, you know, not, su not such a big hurdle. Um, but yeah, and that's one way where maybe the law, sort of old law built on a much older model of the workplace is actually could create a little bit of a hurdle that maybe there are certain instances where, you know, you think at a certain firm level, uh, we'd love to be able to, you know, talk with the employees about how AI practices are going to get used and that they'll have to be mindful uh, of, of the 8A2 problem. So that, yeah, that's a great question. And then like in our industry, which is, again, it's kind of, entertainment is kind of unique because it, um, uh, the way, just the way the inter the industry works for our creative professionals. Um, one of the areas where we've worked very closely with employers in the past, for instance, is in, in connection with copyright law. Um, we filed amicus briefs. We've supported legislation together um, because you know the employers. We our, our members have an interest in the employers having copyright protection because their exploitation of their movies or shows or whatever. Um, generates ongoing residuals for our members. So, you know, there is a, there are ways to work together kind of outside the subjects of bargaining as well that will have an impact on, you know, particularly in the public policy um, context. So I think there's, there are a lot of ways, um, you know, to, to do it. And even going to the question before about bias and hiring, um, there could be uh, consortiums around that, consortiums around other things where it's, you know, just helping to develop best practices that don't necessarily impact specific companies or specific employment decisions and, and the like. So I think there are, there are ways to to do it. What it will look like with AI, I think we, you know, we will see how that develops. Andrew, one last question. You can uh, <laughs> tilt it up. Yeah. There you go. Uh, you talked a lot about the uh, the writers and the screen actors for and how they interacted with AI, but how is that supposed to interact with other industries like construction? Like for the operating engineers, they've the, they run the heavy machinery, and there's already talks mm -hmm. of like one person with a remote controlling a whole field of equipment that's. Yeah. operating autonomously excuse me sorry um so and but now with ai there's a chance that even that person controlling it might get replaced yeah. how are unions and like I, I don't want to say more traditional but how are they supposed to cope with ai if like their entire employee base is potentially about to be replaced and how are all those employees supposed to live on if they're good, like high paying, like highly skilled work is suddenly gone and they're really not able to find a good alternative? I think that's the age old question for labor, isn't it? I mean, uh, Jeff mentioned the Luddites and um, evolution of technology. Um, we've seen it in countless industries as you know automotive manufacturing has changed has moved has you know evolved with robots um but that's why we you know for in, in our case that's why we created this this um the AFL CIO has the future of work coalition i think it's called um and that's who we kind of work with on um this conference that we do so this last year at CES um, unfortunately, for various reasons, I missed our home conference, but we had speakers from, you know, all kinds of different unions. It isn't just an entertainment conference. It really brought together, there were, um, you know, hotel workers from Vegas that were at this conference, you know, and in large numbers, there were Teamsters, there were um, longshoremen, there were a whole bunch, I think there were steel workers and teachers. So, you know, that's part of what's happening in the labor movement right now is that there are these ongoing dialogues happening in these industries that are being impacted by the technology about you know how to address it 
And, you know, some of it probably is going to involve um, job retraining, other type of, um, you know, initiatives. I, I don't what you what have you seen? Yeah, no, so and even the, the sort of Microsoft uh, AFL agreement had some language talking about, again, preparing workers for dealing with um, the effects of technology. But, you know, the bottom line is some, some employees are going to get hurt. I mean, and, and I'm a big believer that overall the technology is going to be better for the overall economy. But there are people, individuals that are going to be hurt by it. Uh, and what unions can do is at least try to stave that off, minimize it, and then help as best they can. But that's going to be perfect. Uh, and that's an unfortunate reality. Um, but, I'm, you know, it, and it does, but even Hollywood, right? Hairstylists, makeup, things like that. I mean, these are people who need more, like, sometimes need more direct effect. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's literally... we have member groups who are who are terrified about how this is going to impact. Um, you know, we've heard a lot from the stunt performers, from the voiceover community um, about how this is going to affect their jobs. And, you know, that's why our, um, you know, our, our language it tries to at least to some extent, you know, delay it and work with the technology rather than just you know, bury our heads or pretend we can work around it. But I do think that there is, this is an area where there's a lot of bipartisan agreement as far as retraining. I think that there's certain areas of AI that are more polarizing, but I think that there is general agreement that retraining needs to be part of this. But I do agree overall that this has been an age old debate, you know, with the horse and buggy when the car was introduced and, you know, the computer when it was introduced and the internet and so forth. So I think, that, yeah, and I think that it's going to affect I me. Mean, here we are at a law school. It's going to affect lawyers. I think that, you know, one of the greatest concerns is, you know, I think of the AI tools that are available in the legal field and it's like, why use an associate? And it's, uh, you know, just as far I as we saw that in a case recently, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it's, uh, but it's, it's something that I think that we'll, we will evolve with.